Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to any guests who are with us this morning. We are grateful to have you come be in worship here with us. Um, just wanted to share about that announcement that went out for the music ministry. They're going to be meeting on Saturday the 24th. You can sign up online. And so all those who are in that ministry and would like to become a part of it, it's going to be really a, a fine-tuning and going in a strong, powerful direction. And so we're excited uh, for what the Lord's doing uh, in Thomas's leadership with that and that ministry. So I encourage you to be a part of that. This, um, this morning, we're, we're going to go to uh, John chapter 4. So if you'll turn with me to John chapter 4, one of my favorite chapters uh, in the, the Word of God. And we are going to look at this concept this morning of living water. Um, I'm going to be preaching at West Denver Bible Church next week. And then when we get back, we'll probably begin our uh, study through Philippians to really understanding how do we abide in Christ in this deeper level of all that we've been learning. So let's go before our God and pray. Father, we come before you and I thank you that we are so aware the only way we can approach your throne and find favor and not death is because of the death of your son, because of the substitute that you put up on a cross and bore the wrath that was meant for our sins. God, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray don't let any soul get distracted from that onto lesser things. Lord, I pray as we come now this morning and we look at this living Christ, your spirit delights to shine on him. Um, just Holy Spirit, would you put the floodlight on Jesus Christ this morning? For what every soul needs here this morning, we all have different needs, what we need to get from the living water. And I pray that everyone in here would drink deeply this morning. And so God, we pray, let this continue as a worship service now in the word of God. Meet us, we pray, in Christ's name, amen. So John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus said to this woman at the well, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So if you would have known the gift of God, which is his grace, if you would have known the grace of God, you would have asked for this. And so we're going to watch how Jesus dispenses grace to a woman at the well in Samaria, and she will sing grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. And I want us all to join in that chorus as we close. <clears throat> so the outline for this morning is we're going to look at the surprise of grace, then we're going to see the ultimate satisfaction that is given to us in grace. And then this beautiful way uh, how Christ reveals grace to this woman. And then there's a response to the grace of God. So let's begin looking at the surprise of grace. If you'll come with me to verse 9. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, Jesus, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And so she's very surprised. Why are you talking to me? And then in verse 27, at this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman, yet no one said, what, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the apostles are amazed. They're surprised at all of this. Look with me in John chapter 3, verse 34, the close of that chapter. <clears throat> For whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Jesus, I'm speaking the words of God for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God is abiding upon them. And now we move into this section based on those powerful statements. In chapter 4, they're in Judea, and Jesus and the disciples now are going to leave on their way to Galilee and on the way, they're going to go through this town of Samaria. And most Jews would not even travel through this region because there was such a deep enmity towards Samaritans. Don Carson shares in his commentary that after the Assyrians captured Israel in 722 BC, 
They deported many of the Jews and they intermarried with the Israelites and the Syrians, uh, which God had commanded them not to do. And then after the exile, the Jews then returned to their homeland. But now they had what they called these social half-breeds, which, which they disobeyed God. And this group is the Samaritans. And they erected a temple then, the Samaritans, in their own land so they didn't have to go to Jerusalem to worship because of this great enmity. And as a result, the Jews disdained the Samaritans deeply. They were hated. They were avoided. Uh, Hatfield and McCoy kind of thing. So look with me now in chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, and he left Judea, and he went away into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. And so this, he had to pass through Samaria, it, it means I have an appointment in Samaria. And so here's the, the divine uh, knowledge of God, Christ. It's, it's, there's a purpose for why I'm going to Samaria. I have to go there. He comes into this town. Why do you have to go there? Well, to save a Samaritan woman who's caught deep in sin. And I want this whole event to bless your hearts this morning because what I want you to get is, is not that we're to be like Jesus and evangelize this way. There's some principles, but I want you to come to this as we are the woman at the well. We're, we're the sinner. We're the one that needs what Jesus is going to offer. So let's come and drink together this morning. So my first question is, why is it such a surprise? Jesus just comes to town and he reaches through every social barrier of the time. You couldn't be more not woke than what's going to happen in this passage. It's beautiful. The social uh, is, is what's right and acceptable. He's going to just go right through it. He's going to break through the moral barrier because this woman, the reason most commentators believe she comes at noon because most people came in the morning to get water. Why do you come when it's warm and late? It's because no one else will be there. And more than likely, she's the ridicule of the town. We're going to see she has five husbands and living with a boyfriend. And so she comes in the middle of the day. So here's someone that, that, is, that is disgraced morally in that town. And Jesus is going to break right through that. He's going to break right through the racial barrier. Half-breeds who don't worship in Jerusalem. He's going to go right in there. And then he's going to break right through this gender problem and go right up to a woman where a man was not supposed to talk to a woman unless it was someone in his family outside. He's just going to break down all the social barriers of the time, and I want that to arrest you a little bit. Why? He crosses the barriers of these norms to love this woman and to give her living water to her soul. She's on the outside in every realm of society, and today she's going to be brought into the inner circle of the Trinity by grace and by grace alone. And so I want you to hear this out of the gate. It's not your performance. It's not your pedigree. It's not your position in life. It's not your merit. It's not your race. It's not your social standing. Jesus came to save sinners among who I am foremost. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done. It's the most glorious gospel that there is. And look with me. I'm just going to read it. Listen to the way John began this gospel in chapter 1, verse 16. For out of Jesus' fullness, we've all received grace upon grace. And we're going to come look at that. The law was given through Moses, and grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who's in the bosom of the Father. He's come and he's explained him. And so I think it's safe to say that anyone who has received grace is surprised that God gave it to him. Amen? So that's the surprise of grace. Now I'd like to look at the ultimate satisfaction of grace. Look with me in verse 7. So there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. What, what jumps out at you? I know the apostles had some struggles 
But I don't think it takes 12 of them to go buy food for 13 people. I think he wants to get this lady alone with the Savior of the world. And so this is this decreed time of Jesus and this woman, and he's removed all the apostles, and it's going to be a very intimate moment. In verse 9, therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? How, how would you even talk to me? Jews don't have any dealings with Samaritans. Why are you talking to me? And Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He would have given you living water for your soul. If you only knew, ma'am, your soul is thirsty and I'm offering you living water, all the other thirsts that you have have been quenched, uh, have never been quenched by water. You're just getting thirstier and thirstier. And what I'm about to offer to you this morning is living water that actually satisfies. In verse 11, she said to Jesus, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? And she's just not getting it. He keeps coming from every different angle. And it reminds me of Nicodemus a few chapters earlier, one chapter earlier. And it's, unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is like, how do you go into your mother's womb a second time? He's just, he could only see things in the natural realm. And Jesus said, whatever's born of flesh is flesh. You're, you just can't go into the spiritual realm. And here's this lady. She's just staying in the external realm, no matter what Jesus says or does. Uh, in verse 31, the disciples are urging Jesus saying, Rabbi, eat. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him food, did they? And then they just, same thing. I got real food to eat and my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And I've just seen this so many times sitting across from someone at a table or a room or a church and they're blank. You might have come to church your whole life and you just can't see. You just, everything is external. Your religion is how it will help you externally. What I can get, you just can't get to what Jesus is offering. We can only think temporal and we can only think in the scene. The natural man cannot understand the things of God. They're spiritually appraised. And they're going to say things like, where should we worship? At this mountain or that mountain? Verse 12, <clears throat> you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? You're not greater than Jacob, are you? She's kind of sensing there's something powerful going on here. And are, are you greater than Jacob? And he says, yes, I am. And look at his answer in verse 13. Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. You drink this water and you're going to be thirsty in a few hours from this well. But what I'm offering you, woman, is you drink and you're never going to thirst again. What does that mean? You drink this water, and it's going to be a well springing up to eternal life. So what is this water? I pray your souls are thirsty. It's not H2O. And verse 10, it's the gift of God. And so this living water, it's the gift of God. And then it's living water. And when you drink it, you'll never thirst again and it will become a well springing up into eternal life. That's the gift. The water that I'm offering to you will satisfy your soul. It's what every soul is thirsty for. Every soul has been made for God and it's thirsty for God. And you've been made for him and you have a thirst for him. That's why there's world religions. There's this, you know it. And there's a thirst for the living God. I want to be loved. I want to be accepted, received, cared for. I want to have a relationship. I want to be ruled. And I want to have forgiveness of sins and my guilt taken away. 
But it's this deep longing of the soul, and your soul is longing for it, and we try to drink other water to fill it. We spend all of our days trying to find something that will fill that soul thirst. And there's a million different offerings. All advertising is, is this is what you're thirsty for, and it will satisfy your thirst. And you chug it, and it will never, ever quench the thirst. Any other source than the water that Jesus is offering, it actually makes you more thirsty. Anyone, I, I know there's some of you here with diabetes. And one of the first signs when you start to realize you have it is you have an unquenchable thirst. And you drink and you drink water and it just, it won't quench it. And that's what every life is like in this world, is I'm just so thirsty for my soul's empty and it's looking, it's longing, it wants something to fill it. And it just can't get satisfied. It just makes you more and more thirsty. And if you give yourself to any other God, if you give yourself to rest, beauty, purpose, sex, booze, food, traveling the world, give yourself to it, and it just leaves you thirsty. You're going to always, it, it never fully satisfies. I, I, you take all your pictures on your vacation, and when you look at them again, does it do the same thing it did when you were there? I don't even know why we take pictures. I'm getting off. You'll leave thirsty. Nothing can satisfy this longing of your soul but Jesus Christ. And if Jesus says, if you drink this, it'll spring up. And all that thrills my soul is Jesus, and he is more to life to me. And when I drink this water, it will satisfy the thirst of my soul and what it's been looking for my whole life. It's Christ for salvation. He says, I'm a vine. You come to me and you get sap and life. I'm bread. Eat this and you'll never hunger again. I'm water. Drink this and you will not thirst. I'm light and you'll see. I'm the resurrection. You die. I'll give life. This is the whole gospel of John. Jesus, I came to be eaten. I've come to be drank. I've been come to abide in, to love, to receive. It's me. I'm what you've been looking for. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let him into your soul. Let this water go right into your soul. Jesus is offering it. I want you to hear this. You don't drink it with your mouth. You drink it with your soul. It's a soul that thirsts for God. My soul thirsts for the living God, says the psalmist. Let it flow into your being, and a well of life will spring up from this beautiful Christ. I pray for words to express the fullness of Christ. You keep drinking it, and it's just, you can't find words to express it. The soul satisfying, quenching thirst that you have. Oh, woman, I'm offering to you something so much more than water from this well. Will you quit thinking about the well? I'm offering you what you've been looking for your whole life. Life. You've been trying to find in other springs and wells that quench. And if you knew the gift of God that I'm offering to you today, just ask, and I'll give you living water for your soul. What an offer by Jesus Christ. Do you know what this is saying? I heard a sermon probably 10 years ago by John Piper, and he said, he was walking through the airport and there were all these advertisements for food. And he said, I was so full in Christ. They, they did nothing. And there were all these ladies dressed scantily and just billboards. And he said, and I felt nothing for it. And there was all these people traveling to try to find satisfaction. And I was just going to preach at a conference. And he was sharing this soul thirst that has been satisfied in Christ. And he can go through this world now and all the other fountains, they're not grabbing and drawing in like they used to. Because now I'm drinking living water and all those other things are not what my life is about. That's the freedom that Christ is saying, I want to give to you. So satisfied in Jesus, drinking from him moment by moment to fill all our longings and make the ones of this earth grow strangely dim. Just these longings that are driving your life day in and day out. He says, I want to give you living water and fill that. I want you to quit thirsting 
or everything else. You know, what's that? Dos Equis. Stay thirsty, my friends. That's easy. That's easy. That commercial happens every day. You'll keep thirsting. You'll keep thinking this is going to make me happy. And Jesus says, you drink this and you'll never thirst again. Wrong thirst can be filled in Christ this morning. You don't have to spend your life like the woman at the well, looking for what her heart was longing for in all the wrong places and all the wrong faces. You can be done looking for love from men this morning with the water that Jesus is offering. You can be done trying to get accepted in this world by striving so hard. These thirsts can be filled. We sit in church, and many of us are like this woman. And what Jesus is offering, we keep looking for other fountains to truly satisfy us. We come and we worship and we run back to all our fountains. And Jesus just says, I want to be living water to your soul this morning. I read once about a man that was found dead in the desert from dehydration with a bottle of water right next to his head. And I just see this everywhere. Drink this water and you'll never thirst again. So the surprise of grace is that he breaks through every social barrier to come meet this woman. And then the ultimate satisfaction of grace is you drink the water that I have and you'll never thirst again. You're going to find what your soul has been thirsting for all of your days and all of your life. And now I'd like to come look at the revealing of grace and watch the, I don't know, the master way that Jesus will lead this woman to the living water. So verses 13 through 14, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. <clears throat> but whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. What an offer. Isn't that beautiful? Look at her response. The woman said to Jesus, Sir, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw again. I love what you're saying. I don't ever want to come back to this well again. Give me that kind of water. She just can't see what he's saying. I'm so tired of coming here in the midday sun and being mocked and rejected. I'm just done with it. I remember I watched this movie and there was a guy, Michael Keaton was the actor, and he's a manager, and he's trying to encourage his workers in perseverance. And he says to him, guys, it, it's like this movie I was watching last night. It, it was Rocky. And the, and the guys go, well, uh, which Rocky? He goes, uh, I don't remember. And he just starts going, and they're like, was the manager dead or alive? And he goes, I, I don't remember. And I mean, he keeps trying to give this point, here's what I want you to do. And they just keep wanting to figure out which Rocky it was. And when he walks away, the two guys look at each other and go, he's never seen Rocky. And I just, that's all that came to my mind is, do you see living water? And, and well, I like the well. I don't want to come back here again. And you're like, she just can't get it. It's not breaking in. I've had times sharing the gospel and, and the questions are like, well, would, would it be wrong to marry this person? Do I got to give up smoking? Do I? And, and no matter where you go with the gospel, it's just the natural realm. You just can't see. So come with me to the God of grace who wills for this woman to drink living water. Verse 16, he said to her, go call your husband and come here. Why would he do that? Is Jesus shaming her? Go get your husband. We're going to find out she has five. And the one that she's living with is not her husband, it's a boyfriend. Why would Jesus do that in the middle of this beautiful, powerful section of offering living water. And I want to show you that Jesus didn't change the subject. He's, he's going to go inward now. And so my heart is so tied up in sin 
and hurt and shame and usury and being unloved. That living water can't flow into my heart. It's dammed up. It's so blocked. It's so closed off. It's, it's off limits. I don't talk about the inside. I've spent my whole life callousing it. We don't go there. There's too much pain, hurt, and shame. We're not going inside. I can't go there. It's just way too painful. My heart is such a dark place, and it's closed up, and it's locked off. You're not going there. Anyone there this morning? Jesus wants the water to go into that heart that you've been keeping closed and shut off to everybody. I don't want you to miss what he's gonna, he might say to you even this morning. Maybe you don't have five husbands. Maybe it's the rich young ruler and he says, go sell all that you have and come follow me. And you don't get saved by selling your possessions. But that man's idol, why living water could not flow into his heart was his love of riches. And so what would he say to you this morning? Is there something that is so closed up? I will not let go of my pornography. I will not let go of whatever it is. And living water is not getting through this heart. Abraham, go put your son on an altar. Your love, your hope, your focus. Maybe today, you've got to put your kid on an altar. Your grandkid. Maybe you're Jacob. And you've got to put your deceiving and controlling on the altar. Is there anything blocking living water? Bitterness? That Jesus wants to flow to your heart to satisfy your soul. But you have an idol that's blocking the living water that Jesus wants you to drink. In verse 17, the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you've had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said Truly. That's a powerful moment before the living God. So Jesus didn't change the subject. He's opening up this woman's heart right now. And she has been looking to men for satisfaction. She's either wanting to be loved, sex, security. She has been looking for men to fill this emptiness in her heart. And she's living with a man now, and that was unheard of in that day. The pain and the hurt that this woman must have had just grips me. And I've journeyed with some of you, and you've just had to go through one divorce, and it almost killed you. The pain of five. Five times with each one just making a bigger searing hole in your heart. And now you're rejected by society, and your family. You always feel like an outcast in every setting that you go to, even in churches. You walk in and you feel like an outcast, which is a flat-out shame and a contradictory to the heart of the message of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is moving into the heart because living water cannot flow there yet. She didn't get that. And so the great physician says, let's open up your heart as to what's blocking it from the water that I want you to drink this this afternoon. Your heart is so tied up in hurt and shame and guilt and sin. It's those things that the living water can heal you from and transform you. I have a dear friend who's been married three times. When she first showed up at the church, she almost got married a fourth time to a guy who was lying about his faith. And she felt like, I just have to have a man to be satisfied. And she drank this living water. She's like, I don't need a man. I have Christ. I just want him. And I want to die and go be with him. That's what this living water can do. 
So Jesus in love is showing this woman her soul thirst. Five husbands. She is thirsting for something. And none of these men have, have filled it, have quenched it. It's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And Jesus comes and says, I've got living water that will satisfy the deep longing of your soul that all these men have not been able to fill. Quit looking to men. Look to the man. The Lord Jesus Christ is offering you water. And even this morning, he's offering it to anyone tied up in this knot. What is your soul really thirsting for? Shadows. Shadows and what it's longing for is him. And Jesus is saying, come to me, drink this water, and it'll be a well springing up to eternal life. Jesus is showing this woman, you have a soul thirst. I wonder if anyone's meeting themselves this morning. Do you have a soul thirst? And you just keep running from thing to thing to thing, thirsty. And you just go from people to people to people, and they're not filling it. And I go from church to church to church, and it's not filling it. I've had 27 jobs, 16 hobbies. I serve in the church, and I get busy. I do rule after rule. I learn doctrine after doctrine, and I'm thirsty. It's not satisfying my soul. I'm just so thirsty. Jesus says to you this morning, go get your husband. Go get your husband. Because he desires to fill all of your desires. To let living water spring up into a well of eternal life. Verse 19, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. The light's beginning to break in, right? That's pretty perceptive. And she's going to later run through the whole town and say, He told me all things that I did. So she's starting to figure out something big is going on here. This guy knows everything about my life. And he's just opened up that hard heart and exposed and revealed how thirsty I really am. What do we do? We try to distract now. We, we try to get him away from what he's doing. When, when someone starts coming into my heart with the gospel like that, I got to get away. I, you don't come to the light. You, you, you're a cockroach. You flee from it. And so she's now going, I don't like how uncomfortable this is making me. I, I, I've, I've worked long and hard to harden this heart, and this guy's going right into it. Let's get off of my husband's, please. Don't keep getting personal with me. I don't like going into my heart. I don't like someone knowing all about my husband's and boyfriend's who's a prophet. It's very uncomfortable. What about dinosaurs? What about gay marriage? What are your feelings on evolution? What about there, there's only one way? We're modern people. That just seems too narrow. Why do bad things happen to good people? Whatever it takes, let me get away from this heart-penetrating truth that my soul is thirsty and I need the living God. Let me distract. Let me move. Let me get out of here. Are you doing that this morning? I'm going to ask you to stop. And let the living water come in. In verse 20, she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and the people say it's in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So enough with my adultery. Let's talk about which mountain we're to worship. Should we keep coming here to this one that we created or the one in Jerusalem? Uh, where should we worship? And that was the wrong question to ask Jesus. Okay. I'll answer that question because you're moving right where I want to go. And we're going to go in deeper now with that question. And let's watch grace on the move again. Jesus just keeps moving into her heart. Um, I remember reading about Robert Murray McShane. It said he would get up and start preaching and just keep coming at your heart. Just, it just kept coming and coming. And Jesus is doing that this morning. He's coming. He keeps moving inward. And his answer is profound. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. 
We have this promised Messiah. We've been told he's going to come, what he's going to accomplish, what he's going to do. We, we worship the way God has told us salvation is going to come. But an hour is coming. And every time John says this hour, it always refers to the cross. And so now he's moving into the cross. An hour is coming. And now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit, on the inside with a new heart, and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so he just blew open all of redemptive history in one answer. We're no longer going to go. That's the wrong question. This, this worship going to a temple, the hour has come for that to end. And now I'm going to be the temple. I'm going to be the meeting place between God and man. I'm going to be where you come to worship. And now you can worship all over the world because you don't have to travel to Jerusalem. By the Spirit and in truth, you can now meet with God through Jesus Christ and worship. And the Father is seeking those ones. He's hunting her down because he wants her to be set free and to start to worship now from the Spirit and in truth. That, that heart is going to be released to be able to worship the living God. Isn't that climactic? So the hour is the cross. And I want you to catch this as we close. This is why he can offer you living water this morning for your soul. Because the hour's coming where Jesus will go up on a cross and he's going to hang on it. And he's going to be put up there willingly, voluntarily in our place to bear the wrath of God for our sins and our iniquities. All that this woman has done, all the things that I have done are going to go up on the God-man. And Jesus is hanging on it. And while he's hanging on his cross, he says, I thirst. And in Psalm 22 on the cross, he goes, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'm bearing the full wrath of God. And we've had this intimacy forever. And it's being broken. And all I have is unending wrath of God, not just separation. I have his full wrath just pouring out on me layer after layer after layer. And now I thirst. He's not thirsty for H2O. I thirst because I am under the wrath of God. I'm disintegrating the, the heat, the, the wrath, what's coming on me. As the fury of that fire is upon the Son of God, he just says, I thirst. I thirst. It's not so much the physical thirst. It's what we have in this passage. He's crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The presence of his Father is gone. The wrath and displeasure are upon him, wave after wave. And he's saying, I thirst for what? the living God. I thirst for my Father. I'm under His wrath. I'm separated. Why? Why? I'm in agony. I'm being separated from Abba. And the answer is He died of thirst. So you could have living water here this morning. The thirst will never, will never understand the thirst that He was bearing. And He did that so you could drink living water and have your soul be satisfied in this Christ and your sins forgiven and brought into a relationship with God. You can be joined to God in his love and favor forever. So what is going on? Jesus takes her question, but that is not what she wanted and he just keeps moving inward. And he's been doing this so deeply in my own heart the last four months. He just keeps going inward and inward for living water to fill up the longings and satisfy him so deeply in Christ. That's what he wants to give to every soul here this morning. And if you'll look at me in verse 25, the woman said to him, this is beautiful. I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. What an what a understanding by this woman. And so the progression is, he says, I'm going to give you living water. If you knew the gift of God, you would, you would receive it. 
And then she later, when she, you know, you got five husbands and living with someone, I perceive you're a prophet. And then he's mentioned it's going to go to the world. It's like you're the savior of the world. And now she's concluding, we know that when Messiah comes, this promised one who will come and redeem Israel, we are looking and longing and urging and hastening that he'll come and declare all things. Are you Messiah? In verse 26, Jesus said, I who speak to you am. Ego me, I am he. I'm the one for thousands of years that's been being written about and promised. And you finally got it. It's not just living water. I'm the promised Messiah. The rest of the passage shows that living water flowed into this woman's heart that day. And she's changed. And it flowed right into her heart. And now the crazy, she loves her repentance. This is what the gospel does. You love repentance. And, and she now, she comes at noon to stay away from the whole society that hates her. And now she goes running into this town. Broad day. And she's telling him, Jesus told me all the things that I've done. And so she's, she's telling him about her sin now. She's not hiding in the corner. This, this is one. This is the Messiah. This is the one we've been waiting for. This is him. And, in, and he's told me all things that I did. He's a prophet. He knows. And she's so transformed and changed. I love these people now. I want them to have living water. I'm going to go and proclaim and share. Look what the gospel does to a heart. I love repentance. I love my five husbands' sin has been forgiven and cleansed and separated as far as the east is from the west. Come meet the man who gave me living water. Her chains are broken. Her false saviors, all of her bondage. She now loves these people despite how they've treated her. And the whole town just happens to get saved from her testimony in verse 42. And they were saying to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. So why do I pick this passage? I've been thinking about this woman and who she was and what grace did to her life by drinking living water. It's profound. And now the instrument that God uses to revive the Samaritans is this woman with five husbands and living with a man now who's drank living water and she'll be the evangelist who will come now and win this town. Dead orthodoxy and religion does nothing to advance the kingdom of God. In fact, it damages it more than it advances it. It makes you mean, gnarly, and judgmental and critical. It just sits in judgment of these kind of women. They'll never know the grace of God. It misses something so big. I think of that woman who was a prostitute, and she's just weeping and washing Jesus' feet. And the, and the Pharisee says, well, he can't be a prophet, or he would know what kind of woman is touching him. Oh, for vital, real relationship with Jesus Christ in this church. Vine abiding followers, bearing much fruit and loving like this. This living water is the purest, best, most refreshing water that I have ever drank. And I pray that it's filling up all the longings of your soul for whatever it is this morning. I'm going to close out with an illustration I heard this week when I was studying. There was this man who was an author. His last name is Gilkey. And Gilkey went to China. <clears throat> and while there, the Japanese invaded and took a bunch of them prisoner and put them in camps, and they were in these horrible conditions. Very small living space, cots right next to each other, horrible food. And this man, uh, uh, Gilkey, was a secular person. And he believed that you don't need a God to be rational, to have a good life. Uh, the goodness of humans will just always thrive because that's who we are. And in this compound, he's, he was almost excited because he said, now we'll see the rationality of man. We'll see that we'll organize our compound and we're going to become a decent society and we're going to weather this storm. But as time progressed, Gilkey became very disillusioned. He said, oh, we were there for three years and what he saw was pure selfishness. 
No one shared. They were cruel. They steal. They lie. They cheat. It was the ones who were educated and uneducated did it. The religious and the irreligious, he said, did it alike. It was just everyone for themselves at any cost. And it proved to this man that his secularism was wrong and that people are basically selfish and cruel. And he said the religious were just as bad. They just felt more self-righteous in their cruel, cruel treatment of others. In the middle of the book, Gilkey, he himself became angry and selfish as well. But there were, he said there was a man in the camp that changed his life. And his name was Eric Little. And Eric Little was a missionary. And in 1924, he won an Olympic gold medal. And if you'll remember the chariots of fire, where he, he didn't run the 100-yard dash, which was his race, because it was the Sabbath. So he ran the 400, and he ended up getting a gold in it. And this guy's the missionary in this camp. And Gilkey said this, rare indeed when a good person gets the privilege to meet a saint. But Eric came as close to anyone that I had ever met to being one. Everyone struggled with anger and despair and selfish behavior. Actually, the missionaries there were worse than the rest. But Eric was always overflowing with good humor and joy and had a love of life, and he was constantly pouring himself out and selfless effort to the pent-up teenagers in the camp. He ran chess tournaments, and he helped them build model boats, square dancing um, for some of the Baptists. I'm sorry. They did square dancing. Uh, they cooked the meals. We scarcely would have survived without him. And then he died of a brain tumor before our liberation. And so this man tried to figure out what made him so different. And he says, religion is not the place where the problem of man's egotism is automatically solved. Rather, it is there that the ultimate battle between human pride and God's grace takes place. Human pride may win the battle, and then religion can and will be one more instrument of human sin. But if there the self does meet God in his grace, drinks living water, and so surrender to something beyond his self-interest, the Christian faith can prove to be the needed and rare release from human, human and selfish concern from drinking from other cisterns. Religion earns salvation and fills you with pride. And what this lady received that day was grace that humbles you and makes you rich to be a person that the world needs. And a whole town was changed because the grace and the living water that that lady drank that day. Whole towns get saved by your loving, joyful proclamation and great transformation that grace has done to your heart. Amen? I'm going to close with a, a poem. And it's um, a poem that uh, Danelle wrote for our lamppost ministry, which is where you take those bags and you look for the, the homeless and to give it and a gospel presentation and to care. And she, she wrote a poem for that ministry, and I just think it fits with... John 4 so well that I'll read it and we'll pray. She wrote, The lost and broken soul, place to place I roam, who has in hope no place to call home. Share the light of Jesus on me. Shine the light of Jesus on me. Share with me the good news so that I may believe. It's me that God will choose. Please don't judge me. Open your heart instead. Tell me of the Savior for sins on the cross he bled. For I'm thirsty and hungry. Please lend me a hand. Share the bread of life. Share the living water. This by God's command. Help me, brother. Help me, sister. In a prison I have been. Tell me of this Jesus who can set me free of sin. Please don't scoff and pass me by. Oh, that is my greatest plea. Please show me love and grace. And may God grant you eyes to see. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the testimony of this woman. God, I thank you for the beauty of grace that it hunts us down and it pursues us when we try to distract and move away from it. In this gospel, when you draw, you open up our soul thirst and you show us that nothing on this earth can quench it. None but Jesus Christ. And he can satisfy what every soul in this room is longing for. If any have come into our midst, who have never drank this living water. God, I pray this morning, have them go get their husband. I pray, show them what they're thirsting after and how it's not working. 
God, let them see Jesus and come to him and believe and look at that cross that he died on and there find eternal life. God, I pray that all of our hearts would be made full and we would keep drinking this living water. Whatever idols are in the way of it quenching our soul and filling us up, God, I pray, remove them. Work in each one of our hearts and let us be this kind of woman who will go into our cities and towns and families and tell of the living water and soul-satisfying drink that we have found in Jesus Christ. Jesus, I thank you that you thirsted on that cross so we could drink this living water. To God be the glory for Jesus Christ. Amen.